So how have you found it comparatively being in the US? I have personally found it to be a space where I don't feel like the clock is ticking because that was another problem I had in the UK. I feel for women specifically, there is so much ageism. And I was, you know, constantly kind of given the feeling either by my peers or by other kind of, you know, executive people in the industry that's like, oh God, you know, you're pushing 30. So what are you going to, what can you possibly do next? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Now off to the glue factory. And so, you know, and I was feeling my kind of opportunities drying up really quickly. So I was just like, I think it's just time to, I think I'd rather leave before I get pushed out. And I didn't think that they would ever let me participate in comedy. In fact, like no, no agent would even meet with me, you know, for like a year of me trying, like no, as in no acting agent would meet with me. No, no one could look at me as anything beyond like T4's Jamila Jamil. And so I couldn't, I couldn't get my, I, I didn't, I didn't have access to, to indulge or like just try and all the things that I thought I might be capable of. And over in America, it's just been a more welcoming space where no one ever asks me my age. It's not an issue. No one cares. You know, I remember coming over here for the first time, turning on morning television and seeing like uh, an African-American, like curvaceous woman in her late fifties hosting the biggest morning show and just thinking, oh wow, that's so inspiring and cool to know that there could be a real career for me in uh, like in a in such a significant space at any age going forward at any size going forward and so you know I've been warned by people over in the UK before I left for the US that I was probably too chubby I was a size fucking 12 uh, mm -hmm. that I was a little bit too old and that I'm you know I'm South Asian I'm a bit too ethnic and they don't really have South Asians in Hollywood I was so fear-mongered about leaving the UK as if that was my safety bubble and yet when I got to the United States is where I was able to fully flourish now would I have everything in the US without my career in the UK? Absolutely not. But I do feel like I was denied the chance to fully spread my wings. And that's because we are, we are so behind the times. It's and really we interesting the point you make about versatility and how in the US mm. there's just much more of an understanding that you can move fluently through different parts of the industry from a mm -hmm. host to a writer to an actor. And that, that's something that's really frowned upon here. You kind of stay in your lane. And the best thing that can happen is you get known for one thing and you get opportunities in that one thing. But that's also that's like, that's the great strength. That's the great strength. They look at it as a strength. They think, oh my God, you can do this, this, and this, and this. Fantastic. Then we want to work with you more rather than like you're spreading yourself too thin or you don't want to be a jack of all traits, master of none. It's like in America, they're like, be the jack of all trades, you know, try everything. You never know where your strongest talent may lie and you never know when in your life that may come up. And again, I think in the US, they're very open to you making it later in life. I never thought this would happen for me in my thirties. I was so conditioned to think I was way over the hill. And so to have proved that wrong to myself and to other young women and South Asian women, that you can be loud, you don't have to be the doctor, you don't have to be the best friend, you can make your own rules. We always had access to this and we just didn't know because we were told we didn't. We were told not to ask for more. Tell me about the transition to acting because that was one I, I'm personally particularly fascinated by. And you didn't have a background in acting, if I'm right. And it was your first yeah. audition that landed you your role in The Good Place. Well, I was Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream when I was nine, actually, Aqua. <laughs> so I've at my primary school, so I would like you to not erase <laughs> my previous uh, craft. I didn't um, mean to say <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, it was not something I planned, uh, but not having a plan in this industry has probably been my greatest strength and accidental strategy. Uh, or maybe deliberate strategy. I had moved over to the US. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I was definitely running out of money. I wanted to be a comedy writer or get into comedy somehow because it was the thing that I'd loved the most all my life. And I hadn't yet had an opportunity to really indulge in. And I wrote a pilot. It got me signed to a manager. I didn't yet have a visa over here. Shh. And <laughs> he, he was also working at the same management company that was making The Good Place with Mike Scher. So they needed a tall, South Asian, annoying English woman uh, <laughs> to play the part of Dahani Aljamil. And they, they didn't have many South Asians because that is something America is still fucking behind on <laughs> is that South Asian representation. So they were like, 
would you do it? And I was like, I'm not really an actor at all. No. <laughs> and they, they basically begged me to go forward for this audition. And I, you know, I just thought it was ridiculous. The idea that I have no training. I could never, I could never act opposite Ted Danson and keep a straight face. Like how dare I? Uh, but they pushed me to going to that audition. I went to it just thinking, fuck it. It'll make a really good column for my, you know, my, I think I was doing a column in Cosmo at the time. It would be really funny how I fucked up this audition. And I went there with such little expectation and with no self-consciousness because I thought it was so stupid, the fact that I was there. And I think they must've mistaken my, my <laughs> just lack of inhibition for extreme confidence. And I was cast a week later as one of the main cast members on what would go on to be this really beloved show opposite Ted fucking Danson, who's one of my all time heroes. And so I got my career in comedy on my first audition. And that was, that's not a popular story over here. No other actor likes hearing that story, but it, it again speaks to the fact that, you know, we have all these skills that we don't even know we have because we're told not to even to investigate them because we're told, especially as women, especially in the UK, to be grateful for the little, for the morsels that we have. It's like, you're lucky to be in the room. There's only allowed to be one of you in the room at a time. And so therefore you have to, uh, you have to just eat what you're given and shut the fuck up. And I think that that moment was such perfect proof to me that I don't know what I'm capable of yet. I might not even be done. There might be other things that I can go out there and do. And damn it, I'm going to try them now that I know that it is actually possible. One of the things that I really love about you, Jamila, is your uh, consistency in biting the hand that feeds you. So while being in this industry, seeking opportunities, continuing to call out the very people who uh, you rely on in terms of their uh, bad practices on body image and feminism, racism, inclusion for people with disabilities. What's that like? And I know you've said that you don't, you feel you can because you in a way don't have anything to lose, but you do. You've worked hard to build this career and you seem to be enjoying it. How do you reconcile the risks that you take or do they feel like risks? They don't feel like risks. They feel like my duty, you know, like and maybe they can be a risk and a duty at the same time. But my driving force since I was 19 years old has been to make sure that I help people or I just wake them up to the things that I was not awoken to when I was younger. And so that is my main career. And I moonlight as a public figure or I moonlight as an actress. And so those are things that I do that are fun that also give me access to reaching more and more people with the things that I most want to say. So they are just, I will do this until they run me out of this industry, which they tried to do, <laughs> but I, uh, I'm fairly sturdy. I'm a sturdy woman who feels sure about what my goal is. I know that I make mistakes sometimes, but I also don't hold this idea, this like patriarchal idea that a woman must be perfect. I understand that we can be as fallible as men. We can make mistakes, pick ourselves back up, dust ourselves off and do better and come back. You know, men are afforded this renaissance that women are just not afforded or we're told we aren't afforded. And so I, I know that I bite the hand that feeds me, but it's only with love in the fact that I believe, as I said, in, this, in the power, in the beauty of this industry, we don't have to participate in the greed and toxicity and erasure that we do so willingly because we are too ignorant and, and lazy to learn. We're too, you know, it's so funny how afraid we are of trying something new when every single time we do, it pays off. Look at Black Panther, look at Crazy Rich Asians, Bridesmaids, you know, all of these different uh, films, uh, Four Lions even, like every time we go where we have been afraid to go before and we represent everyone, we break records and everyone, and they, you profit from it. So it's not only, it's not only unkind and poor form to, deny so many people access to this industry. It's also bad for business. It's bad business. It's stupid. You're denying yourself income. <laughs> 